This podcast has not been sanctioned. The battleground was Monday nights. 80. For a campaign of 83 consecutive weeks. 3. There was a clear winner. This is Dork War. Weeks. This is the story of that campaign. 83 weeks. 20 years later, the time has come for the whole truth. For the whole truth. This is 83 Weeks with Eric Bischoff and Conrad Thompson. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to 83 Weeks with Eric Bischoff. Eric, what's going on, man? How are you? I'm doing great. We had a live um, twitch.tv forward slash 83 weeks watch along last night so I could refresh my memory and watch the Great American Bash from 1998. Had a great, I mean, it was an awesome time. Three hours of uh, pay per view and so much of it I'd never seen before. So I'm really excited about this show. Yeah, I think a lot of people lose sight of that, that while you were necessarily booking things, it's not like you sat down and watched the show. I mean, you're working during the show, so you don't really have a chance to dig into it. So some of this stuff, even if you were sort of in charge, would be the first time you've seen it like bell to bell, right? Yeah, it would be because you typically, you know, when you're doing a live show, at least I'll speak for myself, um, you are, you know, I am doing a lot of different, or I was doing, I should say, a lot of different things. And, you know, you're busy backstage, you're making adjustments on the fly, uh, you're dealing with whatever, whatever issues, uh, you know, come up. And you drop in, you know, you walk by the gorilla position and you watch on the monitor for a little bit, or you, you have some free time and you step out and kind of sneak up into the crowd. And I watched a little bit, but I would watch these shows typically when we were producing them live in bits and pieces. Uh, as opposed to sitting down and and watching them in totality, um, so yeah. You see, and plus, you know, twenty some odd years later, you know, you tend to view it differently. Even if you did see some of the stuff, it has a different impact on you, you know, in, in retrospect. So it was really interesting in so many ways. So I'm gonna encourage you if you're gonna go watch this show this week, watch along with Eric. It's still there for you to enjoy at Twitch.tv forward slash eighty three weeks. And you'll get sort of his perspective as you watch the show, but let's go ahead and get right into it. Great American bash. 1998 is happening right in the middle of the Monday night wars because all of a sudden we're all actually won, and nobody really saw that coming. Least of all WCW. And now we're, we're really in the middle of it. Summer of 98 though, Eric, when you go back and watch some of this stuff, it feels like you know, you guys are sort of riding high. You've got the momentum of Goldberg and some other fun creativity, but in other ways, it does feel like you've lost a little bit of the momentum that you had in 97. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I, I definitely think it's fair to say, you know, and that's again, one of the things watching last night on Twitch, um, you know, looking at it, just simple things. You know, and uh, there's a number of people that have influenced the way I think about television when it comes to producing it Um, and and much more in, you know, the last 15 years than in the, you know, the during the period of time when I was actually, you know, learning on the job, so to speak. But, you know, television when it's best is really, you know, a successful effort based on a lot of little details. It's not always the big things, you know, sure. The big things stand out, the big things matter, but it's the little details that allow those big things to really stand out and and become memorable. And there were a lot of little things that I saw last night that, you know, suggested to me, or at least reflecting on them suggested to me that, you know, there was a lot of, uh, we were chasing our tails backstage a lot. There, There was a lot of sloppy shit that I saw on this show. You know, it's funny that we had that conversation at the top. It's easy to, uh, sort of look back on this stuff, you know, with hindsight and, you know, you always say context is King, but we touched on it at the top of the show. You really didn't have a chance to watch this. You were working, but I am curious, were you able to make time? I mean, it feels like you would have to be to watch raw just to see what the other guys are doing, or how did you get the information as to what the competition was doing. Do you have somebody give you a report or do you sit down and make time to watch that show? No, I never watched the show. You know, I know the urban narrative is, you know, <laughs> is different than that. But the, the fact is, um, I never watched raw. I, I never looked at raw as a model of anything that I wanted to do, you know, format wise, I will admit, you know, readily that, you know, w- when it came to our format, um, I definitely kept an eye on it. You know, there were there were things that we wanted to do tactically, 
you know, in terms of being in action when they were in commercial break and starting early when we could, even if it was just a minute or two minutes early to get a jump on them, um, those types of things, you know, overruns, which is something that we created um, and probably still exists today. You know, those, those are all things from a format perspective that I paid attention to. And I communicated directly with Craig Levers um, about that. We worked very closely together on those issues. But in terms of creative and who was wrestling who and, and, and all that, I, I, I could give two shits um, at that point. You know, what was going on in Raw it just wasn't wasn't driving me. In fact, you know, I, I made Nitro successful by being different, by, by trying to be as different from the from Monday Night Raw and WWF as I could possibly be. So it would make no sense for me to watch them in order to, you know, get ideas or or shape the way I was thinking about what I wanted to do in the future. It was the opposite of that. Well, it's just interesting that you say that because so many of the characters that you're pushing here were made stars on the other television and you know, at the same time, a lot of people sort of prop themselves up on the reason WCW didn't do as well here in this era is, well, we couldn't be as raunchy and as adult as the WWF. But then on the flip side, it's no, I didn't watch and I didn't care. Well, let's let, no, let's, 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 as they like to say now, unpack that shit. Let's, l- let's go back and talk about the stars that we have on this show that were created in WWF. Let's, let's name a few of them. Sure. Okay. Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan really was made famous more than anywhere in the AWA. He became a big star in WWF. <laughs> but if, if, you, no, hey, li- you listen, <laughs> listen, you can laugh all you want. You heard Hulk the, on, on the Dusty Rhodes episode. That, that Hulk Hogan character, the guy that taught Hulk Hogan how to become Hulk Hogan, therefore, arguably created that star depending on how you want to define created, I guess, um, was Vern Gagne. It wasn't Vince McMahon. Vince McMahon exploited it. Vince McMahon gave Hulk Hogan a much bigger platform than he ever had in AWA. There's no question about that. But if you really want to talk about creating a star from scratch, taking a piece of clay and molding it so that it can become ultimately what it's capable of becoming, I would argue, as would Hulk Hogan, by the way, and you fucking heard it yourself, it was it was more Vern Gagne than it was Vince McMahon. Okay, bro. Cool story. I'd rather not argue this. It's not a cool shit. story. You heard it. Are you, 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 what do you mean? You can't recall. Did you not hear Hulk Hogan say that? Dude, if you're going to sit here and act like for a minute, the reason Hulk Hogan was over like we're over in WCW was because of Vern Gagne. Get the fuck out of here. He no, I'm a- not saying that. I am not saying that. But we talked about where the subject was, who created the star. Well, no. That okay, let's talk position. about it then. You, yeah. you did so well with the diamond stud that he fucking left, became Razor Ramon, and then you paid him a multiple of what you were paying him before as the diamond stud. That's and what guess happened. what? I didn't, I didn't create the diamond stud. I had no hand in the diamond stud, but here's a fact for you on this beautiful fucking Sunday morning when diamond stud left and went to WWE and became razor Ramon. Guess what happened? He came to WCW and I made him a bigger fucking star. Yep. From watching argue their TV, that, argue that bitch. Oh, it's not hard to argue. You took their fucking stars and made them a star on your program. You're sitting here acting like you never made watched them bigger, I created a bigger star. You go to any Comic-Con. No, I'm not, I'm not arguing let's, let's that. See, I'm not hey, arguing that hey, point. Hey, hey, are you booking Are you booking a panel with Diesel and Razor Ramon? No. You're doing an NWO reunion. Why? Because it's 10 times bigger than Diesel or Razor Ramon. Either one of them combined were when they were in the WWF. Because I single-handedly Eric, made them bigger stars. They can't make appearances as Razor Ramon. They don't Why not? the trademark. The reason they're not on the comic cons as Diesel is because they fucking can't be. Don't sit here and jack yourself Bullshit. off. They Bullshit. can't be Razor Ramon and Diesel. They don't own the characters. They own their names. They can't be the NWO characters either. They Who owns that trademark? Who's promoting that T-shirt? Who's selling that merchandise? Who had NW? Who had a failed attempt to try to create the stars that I created on Nitro? Brought them in for some piss and lip dick fucking mess of a storyline called the NWO invasion. Oh yeah, that was Vince McMahon in the WWE. Why did he do that? 
Why did he do that? Because they were bigger stars in, in WCW than they were Scott and Kevin when they were in WWE. He didn't bring them back as Razor Ramon, did he? And, and Diesel? No, he brought them back as the NWO. Wonder why, Conrad. Come on, you're a businessman. Why would he do that? No, clearly it's more over. I'm not arguing that. But the point no, was, fuck, you watched. Been doing it for the last four minutes. You watched their show and saw their fucking stars. You could have created somebody out of the fucking power plant to be the NWO, but you didn't because you wanted their stars. You wanted a fake an invasion angle. That's your fucking idea. Now you're denying you did it. I didn't want their stars. I didn't go after them. They what came to the me. What the fuck? You didn't they want came their stars? To me. They came to me. I didn't go to them. No, oh, now it's semantics. Let's talk about how business is really doing yeah, well. Cause like, we're, yeah, because words don't matter, right? No, words matter plenty. But you're going to sit here and fucking deny you ever gave Bret Hart a con. Why would you offer Bret Hart all that money if you weren't watching that fucking program? Is that all you got? No, it's not really, all I got, you, but I'm saying you, everybody, you you got Goldberg and you got Sting. You inherited one, you made the other, and didn't know what the fuck to do with him. Well, everybody okay, okay, let's talk came. about the rest of the guys on this show, like Eddie Guerrero and and and, and Chris Benoit. Thanks, and Paul Heyman. And Thanks, Chris Paul Jericho, Heyman. who, by the way, I made stars in WCW, and they were able to springboard that opportunity to go to the WWE. Come on, let's talk about some of that. Let's talk about how you nobody signed Nobody else had ever fucking seen before, everybody and let's ever live named. in the cave. Everybody you just named came from ECW. If you can't fucking give Vince McMahon credit for Hulk Hogan, then you can't take any credit for Jericho and Benoit. You can't take any of that credit because if Bert Gagne made stars. Hogan. Nobody fucking watched him. Nobody was watching ECW. Yeah, and now what the fuck did Vern Gagne do? Went the fuck out of business. That's what happened. Hulk Hogan oh, man, became a digging. star with you're Vince digging. McMahon. This, that, that, that's, your, that's your response. When, when all of your logic and, and common sense fails... You got to take a shot. That's, That's not taking right. a shot. No, you, you, you're going to sit here and say, well, I made them bigger stars. Well, so did Hulk Hogan. You've got circular logic. This is the theme of 83 weeks. Everyone else did everything wrong. I was fucking perfect. Eric Bischoff. I didn't say I was perfect. You made a point. You made a point specifically that said everybody that was on this pay-per-view were stars that were created in the WWF. I didn't say that. That's bullshit. Yes, you did say it. No, Go back and fucking I, listen to I it. Said, well, you listen to it, motherfucker. You, you said... Here's the reality. The reality is the entire angle from the NWO is based on a fucking invasion from the other company. And then you say, I didn't give Jack shit. I didn't give I never two said shits that. what they where were did, doing. Where, where, when did I ever say it was based on an invasion from the other company? The premise of that storyline, I've said it to you on this show. I've said it in every fucking interview I've ever done is the premise of the show is two guys who were in WCW who thought they weren't treated fairly, went to the WWF, came, became stars, big stars, admittedly big stars, I'm not denying it. I'm not trying to hide from it. You can shape that comment any way you fucking want to, but I have admitted that they went on to WWF, became big stars, and then when the time is up, they wanted to come back because they had a chip on their shoulder and make everybody else in WCW pay for not treating them properly. That was the fucking premise of the storyline. Now let's get back to the original point, which was you didn't watch and you didn't give two shits what they were doing yet. You read the fucking results of what they were doing on your show. Two different things. I wasn't reading the results of what they would see, man. You're really trying hard. Conrad, you're trying hard. I give you that, but you're making no sense. Of course I gave out. I wasn't watching it. I gave out the results to minimize it, to make sure that the, the audience didn't even bother checking in. I wasn't watching their show to get ideas or to see who their stars were or to see who I could steal. I know your buddy Meltzer likes that narrative, and I know that you love that narrative, but it's not fucking true. And you could argue with it all you want, but if you want to try to sit there in Huntsville, Alabama, and tell me what I was thinking and have you be able to get inside of my fucking head, then you're a much much better co-host than anybody ever gives you for you're as fucking clairvoyant as Dave Meltzer 
No, I mean, yeah, I am the best co-host there is. I mean, there's no doubt about that. I mean, I'll, 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 I'll concur, but not because you're <laughs> fuck, not, not, not because you're a goddamn intuitive. No, or you're listen. fucking clairvoyant, or you can sit there 1,200 miles away and tell me what I was thinking and what was going through my mind 20 years no, ago. No, I'm not. I'm not pretending to suggest anybody knew what you were thinking. Even you, when you watch a show like this, have to think, "What the fuck was I thinking?" I'm just saying it's clear to me that you had to have some sort of interest on what was happening on the other channel, or you wouldn't have routinely gone to back to the it, same well. Would. You signed it, all the motherfuckers, Eric. You, 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 you're trying really hard, Conrad, but it's, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not going to accept it. They came to me. I didn't go to them. There was nobody else on the, on the WWE roster, WWF roster at that time that we're talking about during the great American bash that I gave two shits about. None. Cool. Let's talk about business because we, we did talk at the beginning of the show about how it feels like you've lost a little bit of momentum from 97, but that's creatively because that is not showing up financially. Pat yourself on the back here. Check this out. Your average attendance in June of 97 is 6,678. A year later in June of 98, we're up 28.5% to 8,579 on average for your shows. Now the average gate, that's also way, way up, but not just 28% June of 97. We're averaging 104 grand June of 98. We're averaging 180 grand. It's up 73%. How shows are being sold out more often. Even cable ratings are up 55% from June of 97. It's a 2.0 June of 98 to 3.1. I do find this like an interesting paradox where you look back and you say, boy, creatively, it looks like we've lost some momentum. But man, the books at the time are stronger than ever. It has to feel like, Hey, I don't know that this is that bad because I'm doing so well. It's a bit of a mixed message for someone who's a decision maker, right? No wrong. It's a, it's, it's a mixed message for someone who was, doesn't really understand the business, but I can tell you even then that I recognized as I, as I do now, uh, when you're running those numbers by me, that's success that you, you read off what we were doing in 98 as opposed to 97 is really misleading because the reason that we, we had the success that we did at this time in 99, 1998 was really because of the decisions and the tactics and the strategy, the marketing and the promotion, all the shit we did in 97. It's not like, you know, the business doesn't turn on a dime, right? It doesn't turn great on a dime really. And it doesn't turn horseshit on a dime. It's a slow turn. And, and, and it takes a while to get momentum in, in either direction, either good momentum or bad momentum. So I think the numbers that you're looking at are probably more of a reflection of what was happening in, in mid-97, late-97, uh, much more so than perhaps what we were producing in, in real time on that particular day. No, no doubt. I know what, you know, I, I, I know. I get, lot, go I, ahead. I'm I sorry. get that. What I'm saying is though, it feels like it has to be a situation where, you know, on the one hand, you know, you, business is so great. You've got to feel like this is just human nature. When business is doing this great, you've got to feel like fucking hey, everything's up. We're doing right. I mean, everything's going according to plan. I mean, that's what I'm saying is you're sort of riding the, the momentum of that wave of success. And it's just human nature to feel like, all right, fucking high five, sold another show out. It feels a little business as usual. And maybe you can sort of take your eye off the prize a little bit, maybe lose a little focus. And maybe it becomes more about how can we, you know, go bigger instead of how can we just keep doing what we've been doing? Probably a fine line in there exists. You know, it's not so much to take your eye off the ball because I remember thinking even in 98, and there was a lot of things going on in 98 that you would never see on camera. You know, 98 was really the beginning of the AOL Time Warner um, merger, and, and it was early. So it, it wasn't like the the impact of that was, you know, all, all of a sudden grabbing everybody by the throat and controlling their, their thought process in their lives. I don't want to suggest that, but it was beginning. You know, I've said this many times before. It was in August of 98, 1998 that I was ready to quit for the very first time because I saw the handwriting on the wall. So even going into the Great American Bash here, there were, you know, there was manifestation of those changes and the frustration that came along with it. And did I take my eye off the ball? 
Um, I guess you could probably say that. I mean, I don't know that it's, you know, because I was just sitting back smoking a cigar, having a beer. It's because there were other things that I had to focus on at that time that took my eye off the ball to a degree. Um, but I do remember thinking, and, and it became really obvious to me watching the show on Twitch last night, that there was a lot of things creatively that I was beginning to question that I really didn't like personally. And this is where I struggled the most. And it probably is a reflection of my lack of experience and, and confidence when it came to, to booking. I mean, I, I did have a pretty good feel for the NWO story and, and where I thought I wanted that to go. Um, initially the, 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 the challenges that I had though, was for example, the misfit kind of, presence on the show. I never really dug that. I never really dug the Raven character. There was a lot of things that I was just slightly uncomfortable with. And I can only, you know, the analogy I can make is if you sit down at a great restaurant, you order a meal and, and you, you take a sample of your vegetables or whatever it is, or a cut of your meat. And you, you know, it's not bad, but it's just not great. And I remember feeling that way about a lot of things are a number of things that I was beginning to see having a prominent place in our, in our programming. But the, and this is where the lack of confidence, I guess, comes in uh, or experience or both. And, and rather than hitting the stop button, going full stop and going into a different direction, you know, I convinced myself that just because I don't like it or it doesn't feel right to me doesn't mean it may not be the right thing to do anyway, because the audience has a very diverse taste. And I convinced myself, you know, to let some of that stuff go. But again, watching it for me, even in retrospect and, and trying to remember, you know, what was kind of relevant, you know, in pop culture and in, in television and so forth, that stuff was just bad. It was just bad. I wasn't paying and I was, you know, I wanted to beat my own ass last night. You'd have been proud of me because <laughs> I wanted to beat my own ass. Um, but you know, the finishes, you know, clearly one, I didn't have a good feel for it. I didn't have the experience that my position really required. Number two, the people that I had that was responsible for those elements of the show were not really very good at it either. And again, rather than recognizing it and making a change, I allowed it to go on. And I guess when you say, did you take your eye off the ball because you felt like, wow, you're making money anyway, it doesn't really matter. It, if I took my eye off the ball, it wasn't because of that. It, it, I, I had no, no inclination to go, wow, we're, we're making more money this year than we did last year. So I'm just not going to give a shit. That this never been a part of my nature. No, ever. I, I didn't mean to suggest that. I just mean it is. It does give you confidence that hey, what we're doing must be working. Uh, so let's give them more of that instead of maybe the innovation or whatever that was there in '97. But I mean, you guys are still stepping out. All right, Eric, I want to take a time out right here when we're talking about drawing houses. Let's talk about building a house at brandnewhouse.com. You see, brandnewhouse.com can get you into a brand new house with no money down. I know it sounds too good to be true. And let me just tell you, if you're out shopping for a house right now, new is just better. Not only do you get a warranty, you also get freedom of choice. So instead of getting stuck with what someone else picked and all their toenail clippings and their carpet and their old used toilet, no, you can get a brand new house at brandnewhouse.com and you get to pick everything, your color of brick, your kitchen countertops, your flooring, your tile, your shower, everything you get to pick. New is just better, and we make it fast and easy at brandnewhouse.com right now. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket. So what are you waiting for? It just takes a few clicks right now to get into a brand new house at brandnewhouse.com. That's brandnewhouse.com. Don't think you're stuck in your old house. We can even help you with that at brandnewhouse.com. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. It's worth mentioning here on the June 8th Nitro, Dennis Rodman shows up, which is a pretty big deal because you're going to be promoting him at the Bash at the Beach pay-per-view in July. And it's important to remember that this happens when he's a part of the Chicago Bulls and he's missing practice for the NBA finals. And it's rumored, according to the dirt sheets, that just for showing up on Nitro, you guys paid him a quarter million dollars. That's got to be bullshit, Eric. 
that is bullshit. His overall deal was for a, a number. I think we paid him a million dollars overall, which included all of his participation in the Nitros leading up to the pay-per-view and the pay-per-view itself. So that's the way his deal was structured. It wasn't structured to pay him just 250 grand to show up on Nitro. That's not true. Well, it's awesome because, uh, it's a hell of a deal for him. He only gets fined $10,000 by the league and 5,000 by the team, but it does make headlines and you've got to be tickled with that. It's a little mainstream exposure. Is it not? It's not a little mainstream exposure. It was a ton of mainstream exposure. We've got, we probably got over three. You couldn't have, you couldn't have bought the amount of exposure that we got for $3 million based on Jenny. Rodman was at the top of his game. At that point, from a PR point of view, as an athlete, the Chicago Bulls were the hottest thing in sports at that time. Um, There was no way we could have ever gotten the amount of mainstream uh, exposure, especially WCW. You know, WWF or WWF (laughs) could have because they were already getting a lot of mainstream exposure. They had been doing it for years. WCW, no one paid any attention to us, really, until we started. Until we brought in Hogan, we brought in Savage, and then we started stunt casting, if you will, with guys like Carl Malone and Dennis Rodman and others. Then all of a sudden, you know, it started working for us. And I'll tell you what my logic was behind that. It's one of the same reasons why I took out ads in the USA Today, in the sports page, which nobody else had been doing up to that point. Because I wanted, I knew a couple of guys in radio. Uh, Tom Bernard from KQRS in, in Minneapolis was a guy that I was very familiar with in, in when I lived in Minneapolis. And I used to listen to his show every morning. And they got a lot of their material in, when it came to sports just by opening up USA Today and seeing what was hot, what was going on that day in in, uh, in the USA Today's. And so I figured, what the fuck? I'll take out an ad, a big ad in the USA Today as long as I've got Dennis Rodman and, and at least get every sports jock and every AM FM radio station in the country talking about it. And it worked brilliantly. It was a great investment. If you had to ballpark, what did those ads cost in USA today back in the day? I realize I'm, I'm reaching here, but is this a hundred thousand dollars, $25,000? Do you have a frame? Oh, no, you know, I think, you know, we took out a couple half page ads. Um, I think we may have even taken out a full page once or twice. You know, I think they were probably, you know, I want to say 75, you know, for the half page ads, maybe a hundred grand for the full page ads. I can't really remember. I didn't sure. buy them. So it's not that I don't remember. It's just that I never knew. Right. Quite honestly, um, that wasn't my, my department, so to speak, but they were they were expensive, but not when you compare it to the amount of ancillary promotion and marketing and buzz um, that we created with it. It was actually a great investment. No doubt about it. I mean, and it makes total sense, you know, because uh, people still do that now. I mean, obviously behind the scenes these days in, in morning radio or just radio in general, there are subscription services where they pay to have this sort of thing. And so if you're listening to you know, a rock station in Atlanta, and then you're on your way to Nashville, you could probably hear the same bit, the same topic, the same skit that same morning because of those subscription services. And that was all born out of exactly what you said. The, the old, let's just open the newspaper. Let's talk a little bit about Dennis Rodman, because obviously that relationship has a lot of moving parts to it. And we'll probably talk about bash at the beach another time, but at least here we'll go with early June. What's the relationship like with you personally and Dennis Rodman? It was very good. Dennis had an agent uh, who was also Carl Malone's agent, um, a guy by the name of Dwight Manley. And Dwight was really my first contact with regard to that deal. Uh, And Dwight was just a really easy guy to do business with. He was down to earth. He was level-headed. He wasn't trying to rape and pillage and, and overvalue the opportunity. Um, he, he was easy to talk to when it came down to structuring the deal. And because he was easy to do business with, he made it, he meaning uh, Dwight, made it very easy for me to almost immediately start interfacing directly with, with uh, Dennis. And a lot of agents don't do that. A lot of agents and managers in Hollywood do everything that they can, even though Dennis was not a Hollywood star, but it's the same thing. You know, they do everything they can to be the, um, to be the buffer between 
in this case, me and Dennis, because they really don't want too much going on back and forth. They want to, they want to control all of the conversation in both directions. Dwight was the opposite of that. Dwight really encouraged me. And I, and in fact, I remember, uh, the first time I think I really met Dennis, um, it was in Chicago and he was getting ready for a game and he was down, uh, shooting free throws. And Dwight took me over to the arena and said, here, I want you to meet Dennis. And we said, we got along great. And we got along great from the very beginning. It's not to say that we were best friends or anything like that, but we got along really, really well. Dennis is so many, he's one of the most misunderstood athletes, personalities, I think out there in, in our, you know, in the last two decades, he is a very smart guy. He does stupid shit. Like a lot of really smart people do. There's no mistaking that. Um, he's got his demons and his flaws. There's no mistake in that. But he's a very, very smart guy. He's got street smarts. He's got a good read on people for the most part. Um, and he's j- just as generous and kind as anybody that I've ever met. So I get along with him great. Well, it's going to be a big deal for you guys, and I'm sure we'll talk about that sometime soon. But let's do mention that this is all happening around the same time that you guys put tickets on sale for nitro at the Georgia dome tickets went on sale on May 29th and WCW sold 14,546 tickets the very first day. That's an incredible 541 grand. I mean, you've got to feel like, I mean, you're going to be strutting that ass in front of everybody in Atlanta that day. Are you not? What a fucking huge first day for sales for not a pay-per-view, not Starcade, not Halloween havoc, not bash at the beach. A nitro at the Georgia dome. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't so much strutting that ass. I mean, we knew we expected it. I mean, if it would have done anything less, I would have been horrified. So, you know, when you meet your expectations, you, you tend not to get too big headed about it. You're grateful for it. Um, but there was no, you know, nobody was running around. I mean, I'm sure the guys that were in the, you know, the Gary Jesters of the world and, you know, everybody else involved, you know, that was putting that together, um, were extremely happy because it reflected well on them. But from our point of view, uh, we were excited, we were happy, but given, you know, what we put out at the top, I, I think it met our expectations. It didn't exceed them. Well, it's one heck of a show. Obviously, July 6th, 1998 is something we're going to try to cover for you very, very soon. Uh, Meltzer writes that the uh, universal tapings that were happening towards the end of June, June 26th to June 28th, would be the final tapings ever at the theme park, which was years ago, something that you sort of brought to WCW and did revolutionize the way you guys handled TV for a little while. Chat me up about why the decision was made to pull out of Universal. A lot of it just there were there's probably two or three things going on there that I can remember. Um, one of them was there was less emphasis on syndication. You know, the syndicated television business has changed a lot over the last 20 years, and it was really beginning to change uh, pretty dramatically back in '98. There was a time when syndicated television was an absolute necessity, even if you had cable, because you, as, as a, a television producer, a production company, if you had your own ad sales department, you, that ad sales department had to be able to go out to big national advertisers, whether it was m M&M Mars or GMC trucks or, you know, uh, Pepsi Cola, Coca Cola, whatever, uh, any big national advertisers. And you had to represent to them that number one, you, you cleared, meaning you had distribution in 90, 93, 95% of the United States. I can't remember what it was back at that time, but it was probably in the high 90s or, or, or low 90s. Um, and a lot of times, even with, with TBS and TNT, we didn't, ha- we didn't quite have th- that complete percentage of the U.S. in distribution. So having syndication kind of augmented that. Now, I'm going back to 1993, 1994, early 1995. By 1998, that became less of an issue as TNT and the TBS footprint, I'm talking about distribution footprint, became larger. And between those two cable systems, we had, you know, that percentage of the U.S. that that met the kind of advertising threshold that we needed. 
syndication became less relevant to our business model. So it didn't make sense anymore to continue investing the amount of money we were investing in that syndicated product when the footprint that it created was no longer necessary because of the expansion of our cable footprint, if any of that makes sense to you. Yeah, totally. You know, I, I feel like a lot of us grew up on those syndicated tapings though. And we remember some of the things you did, like having the ring spin around and things like that. And, um, maybe it wasn't as exciting as nitro, but it certainly worked for the era. There's a lot of talk during this time about the lawsuit and the legal wranglings with Ric Flair. I'm going to skip all of that for this week because I realize that's going to be a show and a half on its own. Instead, let's talk about another lawsuit that's happening with Jerry Sags. He is sued here, WCW, Scott Hall, and Kevin Nash over what he's claiming to be a career threatening neck injury. And he says that he suffered a concussion and some spinal disc injuries after Scott Hall hit him with a chair at a house show back in January of 97 in Louisiana. And allegedly there is an incident between them and, um, these guys had some physicality. You maybe weren't there at the house show, but certainly you heard about this. Talk to me about the incident and then what you remember of the lawsuit, if anything. Well, I, I can't give you a blow by blow on the incident because I was not there, but I certainly, you know, got an earful of it, um, shortly thereafter. And I, and by the way, I got an earful of it as recently as about a month ago, uh, when I saw Jerry Sags, uh, at a convention, we actually went out and had a beer or two together and he still to this day, you know, brings that up and he still gets hot about it. Um, but it occurred, you know, there was no love lost between Scott Hall and, and a lot of guys and, and Jerry Sags was not, you know, a guy to take too much shit from anybody. And I think the the heat between those two guys escalated, uh, Jerry felt that, you know, Scott took liberties, um, and, and will attest to that to this day, whether you want to hear about it or not. And, uh, and it went down and it was a real injury. It wasn't a bullshit injury. Jerry, Jerry Sags is one of the most straight up guys I've ever met. Um, he'll tell you shit that you don't want to know, but it's because he really believes it. Um, he, he's not a bullshitter. He's not a, a worker, you know, so to speak when it comes to working injuries or, or faking injuries or faking angles or faking issues. He was a straight up guy and he was hot and, you know, fortunately it didn't get any worse. Cause it could have gotten a lot worse between those two. Tell me what you remember about the way the locker room or the office perceived this, because you said, you know, he had an issue with Scott hall as did a lot of guys. It feels as if Sags would have had the support of the locker room, but maybe hall, because he's a bigger star had the support of the office, correct that narrative. And just tell me, you know, what the temperature about this particular incident was in regards to fallout amongst the company. You know, I, I, I can only give you my perspective. I can't tell you what the guys in a locker room were feeling or thinking at this time. Um, when I heard about it, number one, I believe Jerry first, first and foremost, I didn't think Jerry was making it up. I didn't think he was working an angle to get an insurance check. None of that. I believed it. Uh, I had known Jerry since back in the AWA. Uh, I used to hang out with him and Brian. You know, when I first started in the business, so we were, we were good friends. Uh, I mean, again, not to kind of hang out and, you know, have dinner, you know, twice a week kind of friends, but we had a good, a good relationship. And I believed him, number one. And number two, Scott did have, to your point or to your question, Scott did have a lot of heat with a lot of guys in the locker room. Scott was a pain in the ass when Scott was messed up, which was, you know, fairly regularly, um, he was, he was incredibly difficult to work, to deal with. And there were a lot of guys that, that resented him or didn't want to work with him or were hot at him for whatever reason. A lot of guys understood that he was dealing with a demon. He was dealing with, you know, an addiction issue. And that brings out the worst in some people. And a lot of people would, some people I should say, would give him slack and try to stay out of his way or try not to let, uh, Scott bother them when they knew he was, he was in a wreck. Um, but there were other people that just didn't want to put up with this shit. And, and I recognize that now you asked me, you know, from the office's point of view, did, did I, or we as an office collectively, you know, favor one or the other, because Scott was a bigger star. Uh, I think to a degree that was true. It's not that we favored him. It's that we, I, 
I should say, uh, cut him more slack. I tried to accommodate him. I tried to work around Scott's problems for a long time until they became insurmountable. Um, there were a lot of, you know, I got Scott into treatment. I, I put up with a lot of shit personally, you know, that probably nobody's ever heard of, um, that didn't play itself out in front of a bunch of people in a locker room or on television, but up a lot of shit from Scott that I probably wouldn't have put up with, with other people because he was a very critical part of the, the puzzle at that time. Yeah. And I know you probably get shit for that, but I mean, it is what you do when you've got a team. Uh, and I know that's not always popular, but I mean, there's a famous story about, you know, Jimmy Johnson, the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys sort of ha- having a film session and there being a, th- a third string linebacker who kept falling asleep at the back of the film session. So he walks back there and wakes him and says, Hey, pack your shit, you're cut. And then walks towards the front and shakes another player and says, Hey, wake up Emmett. Because, you know, you, <laughs> you can't fucking do it without Emmett and you can without the third string guy. And that's not popular, but that's sometimes what you have to do for the good of the team. So let's talk a little bit about a meeting you had with the boys on that Nitro June 8th. Now, of course, this is when Rodman's going to show up, but your meeting is not necessarily centered around Rodman. It's about the schedule. Meltzer would report, quote, his main topic was promising the guys that he was going to make the travel schedule easier and that they wouldn't book more than 18 dates in any given month, and there would be at least one six-day break every month where there would be no shows. There's been a lot of schedule changes starting in July because of this, although in our last schedule rundown, we had the new July schedule with the week off. The biggest change is that starting in August, Thunder will be taped every other week for a four-hour taping, so that's hours three and four would air on the following Thursday. This probably is a change based on trying to keep the boys happy or cost cutting. What's the strategy here in adjusting the schedule here in June of 98? It was both actually, this is where, and when I should say, this is when the thunder issue became a real, real issue. And we have to go back just a little bit and kind of set the table with thunder. When, when Ted Turner initially called Harvey Schiller. He didn't call me initially. He called Harvey Schiller, who was my boss and said, look, you know, Nitro's doing so well on TNT. I want a, uh, I want WCW to have a live primetime show on TBS because TBS was Ted's baby. I mean, it was all Ted's baby, but TBS is where, um, Ted really got his start. So to speak, that's where he really made his bones in broadcasting. So he wanted to, program WCW under the TBS network. Now, when Harvey Schiller called me and I may have, I don't think I've talked about this on, on, on this podcast with you, but I'll briefly touch on it just to help set the stage. Um, when I got the call from Harvey, I was literally taking my kids, uh, out to Wyoming. We just started building our house, I believe. And we were on our way and we were driving actually. Uh, and, I was on my way and I got the phone call from Harvey and he said, Eric, Hey, how's it going? Just want to let you know, Ted wants a two hour show on TBS. And at first I thought he was just fucking with me because Harvey had a dry sense of humor. He was, he, 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 it was, it was his way of joke or could have been easily been. It was the way I interpreted his way of just fucking with me because he knew I was on vacation and he knew that the ask was going to be an incredible ask. So I, I, and I said to Harvey, I said, Harvey, quit fucking around with me. I'm on vacation. I'll talk to you when I get home. You must have better shit to do than mess with my vacation. He said, no, Eric, I'm serious. And I, it took me a minute to realize he wasn't kidding. I thought at first he was trying to be funny. And I, I, I you know, I didn't know what to say or how to react. I said, okay, well, you know, I'll be back in a few days. <laughs> let's, let's talk it through. Um, I was literally going to drive my family out to Wyoming, leave them here. And then I was going to go back to Atlanta, uh, a, a couple days later. So I got back to Atlanta and I was told not only did we have to launch thunder and an, a, an additional two hour show, TBS wasn't going to pay for it. Wow. I had to find another way to pay for it. So it became my responsibility to figure out how to pay for it. I went to Brad Siegel over at TNT and I said, Brad, well, cause I, I trusted Brad. He was, you know, he wasn't any older than I was, but he had been around the Turner executive committee kind of level for a long time. 
So I went to, to Brad. I said, Brad, what do I do here? And he said, tell Ted no. Just tell him you can't do it. Don't take this responsibility. If TBS doesn't want to pay for it. Now, Brad couldn't come out and say that at the time. That would have been politically incorrect on his part. But he told me confidentially, I guess, as a friend, whatever you do, don't do this. Because Brad knew. Brad was a smart guy. Brad knew that if we launched also on TBS that we would dilute the Nitro product. Right. He knew it. And that's why he didn't want me to do it. It was more selfish than anything else. Selfish meaning he wanted to protect his his uh, franchise on TNT because he was doing so well. And he knew what would happen. But – you know, I, I was not the type of person to try to say no to Ted Turner. <laughs> it just, you know, I was very, and probably am to this day, a pretty loyal person. And if somebody's writing me a check every week to accomplish the goals that he wants to set forth, my job is just, you know, to try to accomplish them the best I can. It, it was a mistake on my part to not put up a fight. Even, you know, Brett said he would join me. Brett, Brett said, look, if you decide to fight it, I'll tag in. I can't lead the charge, but I'll tag in and help you fight it. Just say no. And I thought about it. I talked to Harvey about it. Harvey, of course, wanted to make Ted happy because Harvey Schiller at that time saw the handwriting on the wall and saw an opportunity for, for himself to you know, kind of move his way up the Turner executive ladder, um, and, and particularly with Time Warner coming on. Um, so Harvey was pretty supportive of making Ted happy. Um, so what, let me, now I'll fast forward. I'm sorry. I took too long to explain all the backstory, but when we finally launched thunder, it became very apparent that we were choking out our talent. Meaning, you know, a lot of these guys, Scott, Kevin, you know, Ric Flair in the middle of the negotiations we were having with him, certainly Hulk, you know, a lot of the guys that we signed, even though the face value of their agreements were much higher than the face value of their agreements with WWF, you know, the reason they came to us wasn't necessarily the face value of the contracts. We've covered this before. You know, a lot of guys came to us that were making 700, 600, 700, 800 grand a year with WWE, and they came to us with contracts that were very similar. Um, the difference being that the WWF or WWE contracts, a good portion of that six or seven or eight hundred thousand dollars was was incentive based. It came from arena sales, it came from merchandise sales, it came from pay-per-view buys, whereas ours came in the form of a guarantee. And the reason that people came in a lot of those transitions, a lot of those people that jumped over from WWF to WWE, despite the narrative, didn't make significantly more money at the end of the year. Their 1099s were essentially pretty close. It's just the, the manner in which that money came to them. But the one big differentiation between a WWE agreement and a WCW agreement was the number of dates. Right. I promised guys maximum of 180 dates a year. Back in 95, back in 96, back in 97, a lot of the big names that I was contracting were interested in coming to WCW, not despite the narrative um, from so many people that I was just ATM American dumping all kinds of money in their lap, but it was because they could make a great deal of money, sometimes more, sometimes the same amount, but not have to be on the road 300 days a year. Now you throw thunder into the mix as well as some of our syndicated stuff, which is another reason why we wanted to de-emphasize syndication. Now, all of a sudden, those guys that were promised 180 days a year are looking at 230, 240, 250. And they weren't happy about it. That was the reason for the meeting, is trying to, A, manage our expenses, as you pointed out, B, trying to reconcile some of the commitments that were made with guys who were realizing that we were asking more of them than they, they anticipated. Wow. You know, I appreciate that we're able to have a more analytical version of the WCW story in regards to business and cost cutting and contracts and anywhere else. And hopefully you do too. So if you're listening right now and you're digging what you're hearing, tell your friends, hit the subscribe button. And leave us a five-star review if you think we deserve it. And if it's for, I'll blame Eric. No big deal. Hey, you know what, though? No, no, something nobody's blaming you for right now is the Bischoff Blaster. Man, we had the internet talking about the Bischoff Blaster last week. And I can't help but wonder, you know, what were the results? Round two, 
You've been on this blue chew for a little while now. I think the missus even joined you on Twitch to give her testimony, which I can't believe is real. Tell us what your experience has been like two weeks into using blue chew, Eric. Well, I'm not going to cover the last two weeks in detail, but I'm just going to tell you what this morning was like. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. This morning was awesome because here's how it went down. We went to bed last night, eh, about 1030, 1045. We were both pretty tight. It's typical for us. I got up about 415 this morning because my dog, Nikki, um, the minute there is just a hint, just a hint of daylight, which usually happens around 415, 420 here in Wyoming during the summertime, my dog is all over. She's trying to drag me out of bed to go outside. So I got up really, really early. Took the dog out, played with her for a while, threw the Frisbee about 5, 5.30 in the morning for about 45 minutes, came in, made some coffee, and I'm sitting down there now. Now, Lori's still in bed sleeping. She she wanted to sleep in. She works baby probably six days a week. She's up pretty early in the morning. But on Sunday, she wants to sleep in. So I'm downstairs, and I'm watching the news. I'm drinking the coffee, and I'm starting to think, hmm, about a little morning delight. <laughs> I can't believe this. <laughs> so... So I thought, all right, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it right. I don't want to half-ass this. So I take a shower, get my, you know, brush my teeth, do all the things you need to do right before you get into the game. As I was coming out of the shower, I popped that blue chew. Because now I figure I got about 15 or 20 minutes before I head upstairs. Because I wanted to make her a coffee. I wanted to do all this nice stuff, you know, to, to kind of set the tone. But once it's go time, I want to go. I don't want to wait around. I hate fucking waiting. I hate waiting for anything, especially, especially (laughs) on a Sunday morning when I want to play. So I timed it perfectly. I popped the blue chew just as I was coming out of the shower because I knew within 10 or 15 minutes I was going to be on the field of play, so to speak. And damn, the timing, like my hair, was perfect. Perfect. My God. Go get it right now. It's what he's doing. It's what you should be doing. It's bluechew.com. That's B L U E chew.com. Use our promo code 83 weeks. And I can't believe they're doing this. You get your first shipment free. Use that promo code 83 weeks. And all you're going to have to do is pay $5 shipping. And the great thing about Eric's story, and this is really true. I can't believe he shared so much. You can take these things anytime, day or night, even on a full stomach. And since they're chewable, they're going to work faster than a pill. But best of all, you know, they're using the same ingredients as Viagra and Cialis. You know, these things work, but it's cheaper. So it's a no brainer and even better. You don't have to go to the doctor's office. You don't have to wait in the pharmacy line. This stuff is going to ship directly to you in discreet packaging. And we should mention that it's made here in the United States. It's also prescribed by a doctor. So check it out right now. Find out how easy it is to get back in the game and get your gimmick going at bluechew.com. Use that promo code 83 weeks. That's B L U E C H E W.com. Bluechew.com. It's free. Just pay $5 shipping. And, uh, Eric, I, I didn't know we were going to, uh, letters to penthouse here, but thank you for that. I appreciate it. No, no, that, come on. There was nothing. Yeah. There was nothing. I know, but I, I really anxious about that. It's just life, brother. People are so ashamed. Look, how many t- times a day do you see a Viagra commercial on television? Right. right. They're all over the place. They see are. Alice all over the place. I mean, how about that bitch? Have you ever seen that one? Uh, it, it's like a, uh, a hemorrhoid cream. Where that chick's you know riding a bicycle through a little town called Keister, and it's got this double entendre thing going on. So she's riding around, and she says, "You won't believe what's in this Keister." And she's riding through this little town called Keister, and you go, "What the fuck is she talking about?" And then she rides by the fire department, and some guys out there washing the fire truck. She goes, "We have a fire truck in this Keister." And I'm thinking, "This bitch has got a fire truck in her ass." Why in the world am I watching a commercial about a woman on a bicycle with a fire truck in her ass? I can't figure it out. And then he finally figured it out at the end. Oh, it's a hemorrhoid cream. And she says, if I can get comfortable talking about this keister, you should be comfortable talking about yours. That's a fucking television commercial. So why would suggesting that I take a performance enhancement gimmick, as you say, to, to 
help enjoy my relationship with my wife. Why should that be awkward? No shame in my game. Give your gimmick the hot tag. Go to bluechew.com. Use that promo code 83 weeks. Let me ask you about another performance enhancing drug. And this comes directly out of the observer. Meltzer's reporting quote, one mid card performer actually failed the drug test for a Diana ball, a steroid that they haven't even made in like 10 years, which has a lot of eyebrows raised as to how only one mid card guy could fail a steroid test when there are neon signs all over the place. That wrestler was told by Bischoff he knows to, he needs to go to a one day counseling session, which is one of those that you have to do whenever you fail a drug test. And allegedly, this is your policy for the first offense. This seems sort of silly to me that a mid card guy fails, none of the top guys, but that the punishment, this is maybe even bigger to me, it's just a one day counseling session. Who wrote the policy? Turner Broadcasting. So they write the policy. Somebody brings you the news. And I know we probably don't want to disclose who failed the drug test. So I won't follow up on that. Uh, if it was made public, we would, but I don't want you to necessarily out somebody, even though it's been 20 years, chat me up. Who would have brought you the news? Hey, so-and-so failed Diana Myers. So when she brings it to you, does she also say, by the way, our policy is, or do you just know, or do you have to figure out what the, I mean, cause you don't want to my understanding is, especially in the corporate structure like this, you can't just veer off and do another sort of, I'm going to freestyle your punishment. You got to go buy the book on that shit. So when Diana Myers brings it to you, does she also say, and by the way, and by the way, what he, you've got to send him to one day counseling. So you can't find it. No, I mean, no, the him. policy was the policy and you know, there's no defending it. Right. It was what it was, just like it was what it was in the WWE. There were a lot of guys then that were able to circumvent policies. Um, and they, they, they were blazing signs as well. Um, neon signs over there as well. And there were certainly plenty of them in, in WCW, but the policy that we had was created. I think it was Harvey Schiller reached out to a guy that he knew who administered the drug policy for the U.S. Olympic Committee? Because Harvey was on the board of the U.S. Olympic Committee, I think in 1996 or 1994, whatever it was. He he came from the from the Olympics originally to to WCW. So Harvey reached out to someone that he knew that had credibility in administering this kind of uh, testing and and policy. They wrote the policy. Um, it came through Turner legal, which is why it would have been, um, managed or administered by Diana Myers because she reported to Turner legal. She didn't report to Eric Bischoff or WCW. Uh, so when someone failed the test, they got notified and it was really up to Diana Myers and Turner legal to administer, administer the policy based on upon how it was written. I had nothing to do with it. No, I get that. I mean, whether I wanted to or not, I mean, honestly, it, 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 my, it, I may have wanted to fire somebody for it. You can't. Probably can't. Right. Um, I may have wanted to make an exception for somebody. Probably can't. Uh, so I just, you know, I stayed away from it, to be honest. Let's talk about while we're here. Great American Bash 1998 goes down on June 14th, and we're in Baltimore, and it feels like Baltimore was the home for a lot of Great American Bashes. Why was Baltimore the right city? I think, you know, looking back, you could probably go back to the late eighties with the Crockett's, you know, great American bash was a dusty roads, uh, creation based on what I've heard and, and read and learned over the years. Uh, and WC, it was there for a while. It was kind of like the home of the great American bash. Baltimore's always been a great, you know, wrestling town. Um, and I think there was a lot of, of tendency more than anything, probably more than logic in some cases for, people that were in WCW that kind of came over with the NWA acquisition, uh, guys like Gary Jester, Jim Barnett, um, others who had been in WCW, you know, at Turner from the very beginning that wanted to kind of keep that connection going. And I'm not faulting that by the way, I think it's a great idea. I think the WWE would be smart right now, as long as they're going to explode that or exploit, explode exploit that uh, pay-per-view brand to kind of bring it back to Baltimore and, you know, revive that tradition because wrestling fans like baseball fans, you know, really, you know, they, they love that. They love the history and the legacy of, of 
professional wrestling. But I think the reason for it is because, you know, WCW had the Great American Bash in particular had, you know, an early legacy, at least in the Baltimore area. And like I said, it was, it was a good market. Let's talk about the crowd, man. A sellout crowd here, 12,810 fans on hand, 11,061 of those paid a huge gate, 289,345 bucks and merchandise is still super hot. Nearly 103,000 at the door there. Let's talk about match one because you got to start off hot, man. You've got Booker T the rise of Booker T I'm sure you would agree. And he's finishing up a best of seven series with what a lot of people believe to be the best wrestler in the world. Uh, certainly Mark Madden had called Chris Benoit that on the WCW hotline. And these guys go 16 minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, Booker T gets the win here. And he's also going to earn a television title shot later in the show. Meltzer would write this marks Benoit's fifth straight loss on pay-per-view and seven of his last eight pay-per-view matches. It's all the work that nobody should complain about doing jobs when they are treated fairly, but it's pretty bad when the guys who complain about doing jobs simply never do them. And the guys who were brought up in the business, not to complain, get abused for it. Now that's Meltzer's take, but a lot of the people behind the scenes believe that Benoit is on a bit of a losing streak here because of his relationship with Nancy Sullivan. Obviously Kevin Sullivan is involved in the booking. What'd you think of the match and how would you respond to Meltzer's criticism here? Oh, yeah. let's talk about the match first. Cause it's positive. I, I was so excited watching that match back. I had not, I had not watched that match since probably late 1998. Um, it was a phenomenal match, phenomenal match. The storytelling, the, the back and forth, the structure, the pacing of the match, the, the talent involved, you know, how much they gave to each other. Um, it was really like watching, you know, it was just, uh, it was like watching two amazing flamenco dancers, you know, d- dancing on stage. It was just so perfect in so many ways. And I, I, I don't know. I couldn't be prouder really. I think it, it, it especially seeing it last night on Twitch, I really have to say that, you know, of all the matches that I've seen in, in over the years and, you know, 30 years, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Um, there may have been some equal to, and maybe in some respects, marginally better than that. But I don't think there was a better example of in ring performance in WCW, particularly during the Monday night wars than that particular match in that series. So go out of your way to find that one. It gets three and a half stars in the observer. And I want to mention a couple of high spots. If you're not sold on watching this, Eric's never put a match over like this. So for him to do it, you need to stop what you're doing. Go watch it on the WWE network right now. Booker T and Chris Benoit. They're, they're really cooking with gas here. As they like to say, Meltzer even wrote it picked up at the end with Benoit using a superplex off the top rope and then a rolling German suplex followed by dragon suplex, which got a huge pop when Booker T kicked out as the fans really thought that was the finish. Uh, I didn't want to interrupt you there, but that rolling German thing after the superplex, I mean, everybody thought, well, this is it. And they just kept going a phenomenal match. It was. And I think probably one of the reasons that stand, it stood out to me last night so much. Now it was the first match that I saw, um, last night when I was watching it back, but the finish was so good. You know, and I don't want to jump too quickly into the Meltzer comments because they're not worthy of of our time here, really. But you know, the, if forget about what Meltzer wrote or what Eric says or how many fucking you know Fakakta stars that some jagoff wannabe wrestler who writes a dirt sheet gives it. Listen to the crowd and judge for yourself. You know, watch the match for yourself on the WWE Network. Look at you know if you're going to break it down, if you want to be smart. If you want to look at the product from the eyes of a producer or even from a wrestler, you know, or an agent, look at that match and watch the give and take, watch how they get each other over, watch how they both sell without selling dead because that keeps hope alive. That's what keeps the match interesting to the audience and, you know, take the stars and shove them up Elser's ass and just listen to the crowd. Which, by the way, that crowd didn't give two shits whether, you know, Chris Benoit lost three times on pay-per-view or not. 
They were into the match because of the story and because of the talent. And that, by the way, is all that really matters. There you go. Done with that. No comment about the Sullivan stuff. You want to save that one for another show? No, well, I can't comment it. You know, I, 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 I can't, you know, I was excited about the best of seven and I, and I will say this, you know, Chris and, and Booker weren't initially, I think it started out as the best of three. And because the action was so good, we all went, Hmm, let's do a best of five. Well, best of five was awesome. Let's do a best of seven. And I think somewhere in the middle of that, you know, best of three, the guys were excited about but I think once we went to best of five, they started going, ah, I don't know, man, same old, same old, how are we going to make this work? But, um, we were into it and I, I can't tell you, you know, what Kevin Sullivan was thinking. If he was hot about Nancy or not, it would be, it would be stupid for me to do that. I'd be just like Dave Meltzer at that point. I'm not going to do that. Let's talk about the next match. It's Chris Canyon and Perry Sander. And these guys go almost 15 minutes. And Meltzer would write, this was a hard match for the wrestlers, although both did a very good job. A guy dressed in a Mortis costume came out, which allowed Canyon to sneak in the ring behind Saturn and attack him. And it's clear that nobody cares about Canyon yet. And they did him no favors by leaving them flat when Benoit lost in the opener. Canyon invented all sorts of moves and executed them very well, although both showed inexperience in transition. So overall, Meltzer didn't love the match, but he didn't hate it. He gives it two and a half stars. And then after the match, we see Raven as Mortis DDT, the original Canyon Mortis on the floor and, uh, then unmask revealing that he in fact is Raven. So we've got a cool storyline going here, but the crowd was maybe uh, a little deflated after the first one. what do you think of the match here? I thought it was pretty good. Better than, better than average, better than expectations until we hit about the halfway mark, maybe the two thirds, you know, of the way through the match mark. And then it got really sloppy. Um, Perry was blown up. You could see it. You know, he tried to make it look like he was selling, but he, he, he was selling like a drunk sailor. Um, not like a worker. Um, uh, he was really sloppy. The timing was off. Uh, I wished, you know, watching it back last night, I wish that match would have ended about five minutes before it did. Yeah. And I hate, I hated the finish. I fucking hated the finish last night. It's just, it was, it's just, it was so typical of the pattern of just having great matches with horrible finishes or potentially great matches with horrible finishes. There was, you know, I've said this before on, on this show, you know, one of the flaws, uh, in WCW prior to me getting there, even as a C string announcer prior to me, you know, becoming in control of the company. And certainly during my control of the company is we had horseshit finishes. That was really one of the biggest differentiators between us and WWF. And that was that, that this match that we're talking about is a perfect example of that. It was just fucking horrible. And Scotty Levy, you know, I see Scotty once in a while and, you know, we're friendly and all that, but he just sucked in the ring with a mic. He could do great, you know, vignettes. If you had him, if you produce him, you know, outside away from a live arena, he could do some great shit. And he did, but, on average, I mean, he was capable of pulling one out every once in a while, but this particular in-ring promo that he cut 20 years later made me just shudder. It was, it was so horrible. Ah, oh, man. It's an interesting deal here because there's lots of interference and then it just ends with a Russian leg sweep. Um, it's a clusterfuck. Yeah. It's not interference. It's just a mess. Let's get to the it's, next, let's get to the next match. This is less of a mess. Well, it's kind of a mess, but it's a fun mess, man. It's Chris Jericho and Dean Malenko. They're going to go to a DQ and they're challenging for the vacant cruiserweight title. And, um, this is vacant because they've had the whole schmaz coming off of slam where he wasn't supposed to be in the battle Royal, but he was, and then he won and he was under hood and uh, Jericho protested really classic stuff here. But these guys go all over the place. I mean, all over the place, he, even brawling to the back and even the outside, even taking bumps into the mailbox. Ultimately the match gets three stars. what do you think of, uh, Malenko and, uh, your boy, Chris Jericho. I thought it was great. I thought Chris, you know, in his character, you know, was awesome, you know, just off the charts. Awesome. 
And the same is true with Delinko. You, you couldn't talk about a better contrast in characters. You know, Dean is, Dean was so solid. He was so believable. He was that kind of, you know, John Wayne esque character that it was always going to do the right thing, even if it was, you know, not to his benefit. He was that stand up guy, which is why he's willing to put the belt up rather than take it under protest because he was that guy. Um, the match itself was amazing. I love watching Dean Malenko work again, because I love contrast in styles and characters. And Dean had such a great character. He was so believable. He was really in many ways, in my opinion, um, a throwback to the, to the seventies and maybe the early eighties, but yet had the ability and the skill sets to elevate that style just a little bit and, and have a have have faster paced matches. But he was so believable. I loved it. The only thing I didn't like about it, you know, when Dean was dragging Chris backstage, it just took a little bit too long. And I, I, I I've always cringed whenever we decide we're gonna shoot action backstage because it never looks as good. You know, when guys are brawling backstage, it just eh. You know, they can't sell it quite as well. It's just, it's always a little less than expectations. It took Dean a little too long, you know, dragging Chris by the back of his head, you know, backstage before he finally got some offense in. And here's what really bothered me about it. Once they got outside, what the fuck is Doug Dillinger doing out there? If he's not going to stop it, get the fuck out of the way. He's standing in front of the camera. He's got to know where the camera is. And he's oh, we're looking at the back of his big ass. And we can't hardly see what's going on between Chris and Dean. And I'm, I literally, while I was watching the last night, I'm going, Dillinger, get the fuck out of the way. And that drove me a little bit. That drove me a little bit nuts. And then to make it even worse... The referees out there. What the fuck is a referee going to do? Count a three count? Break b- b- break something up? What is a referee doing out there? If you're going to be out there, do something. Otherwise, don't be out there. Just let the guys fight. It's just a little thing, you know? It's just it's one of those little things that you don't really notice while you're doing it. You probably should, or I probably should have. Um, but when you watch it back, especially 20 years later, when you're a little smarter, a little wiser, a little more experienced, you go, what the fuck were we thinking? Why would we, why would Doug Dillinger be in his big ass be in that shot? And why would a referee be there after the match is over? And these guys are fighting out into the middle of the street. What's he going to do? Count a pinfall in the middle of the highway, stop traffic maybe. So the guys can fight out in the street. I don't know. Sorry. I love when you get fired up at your own shit. I mean, well, I- it's, it's, it was, <laughs> Again, I didn't lay out that match. I'm not, I'm, I, I approved it. I let it happen. Ultimately, my responsibility, my watch. Um, but, you know, I'm looking at it now with a different set of eyes than I looked at it then. And it's like, damn it. <laughs> I hated it. But the match itself was great. I love the comedy. I, you know, I love Jericho running into the building across the street. I love the way that Bobby and Tony and, and uh, Matt, you know, handled it. I, I, there, there's a lot of things I loved about it. But... Doug Dillinger wasn't one of them. Let's talk about, um, the, the backstage skits between both Chavo and Eddie, where they're doing stuff for WCW wrestling.com. And they're talking about how grandma Guerrero doesn't want them to fight. How classic Guerrero is this? Are these skits? It was awesome. I was, I laughed. Oh God, you know, he, and I know we're, you know, we're going to cover a lot of other matches, but one of the things that I, you know, I talked about it last night on Twitch TV, um, you know, the, the opening match, you know, Chris Benoit and the tragedy, you know, involving Chris, you know, the second match is Canyon, the tragedy in, involving Canyon, you know, seeing Kurt Henning and Rick Rude out there, you know, these are guys that I was close to before I got into wrestling, forget about working with them. Um, you know, and, and, and having them pass, seeing Eddie Guerrero, and, 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 you know, the tragedy that involved him, that the, the show was really kind of melancholy for me. And, and I'm not a very sensitive person when it comes to things like this. You know, I, I, I look at life a little differently, but you know, there's just so much of it last night on the show and the, watching Eddie being so entertaining, so creative, a lot of that's all, that was all improv 
There was nobody writing a script for Eddie. He had a couple bullet points. He knew where the match was going. He knew what the angle was all about. And then, boom, we turned him loose. And he was so awesome. And it made me miss, not only miss Eddie, but it made me miss that process. And it made me miss talent that had that ability to just take that mic, seize the fucking moment, and turn it into gold. And that's what I was thinking last night watching that stuff, both with Eddie and Chavo. Let me ask you this. I, I can't wait. This is the one thing that I wanted to ask you about, and you're going to laugh. This fucking video of Juventud Guerrero walking up and down stairs that goes forever, right in the middle of a pay-per-view. What the fuck is this? I, I asked myself the same thing on Twitch <laughs> last night. <laughs> I did. I did. You know, when I first started, I thought, because I didn't remember it, right? I, you know, it's 20 years later. I hadn't watched the Great American Bash 98. You know, so I was, I was, when it first started, though, it had that kind of desperado vibe, you know, yeah. the tight shot of the boots, and he's walking down the stairs. And, and I said on Twitch, I go, wow, this is pretty good. The music was great. You know, the, 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 the photography, the cinematography was great. It had a vibe. It had all the potential in the world. And then it went nowhere. And I said that last night on Twitch. I'm going, well, what, what the fuck is this? What is the message here? There's got to be a message. If you're going to put it in the show, it's got to make you, you know, ask a question or arrive to a conclusion or to feel passionately one way or the other about the subject. And I'm looking at Hoovy. You know, and he's all of a sudden he's disappearing and reappearing on a set of steps. Then he gets up and turns around and fucking vanishes. I went, what? Why am I watching this thing? Where's it going? Now, clearly, I think, you know, in retrospect, that particular vignette was designed to provoke the audience into thinking that that Hoovy was dealing with the issue of being unmasked. Cause he had just been previously unmasked and, and this was a cross war roads of his life or his career. And he was dealing now with the fact that he was out there performing without his mask and all that meant to him, I guess maybe I'm just being a little too liberal and giving someone the benefit of the doubt, but it was weird. It was weird as was the match here with Ron Reese. I don't know. Oh God. Oh, I've been dreading this one. Oh, since about nine o'clock last night, I went, Oh my God, Conrad is going to ask me about this and I got to deal with it. <laughs> it's, it's what you imagine guys who even two Guerrero's taking on Ron Reese. So you've got like seven, two against five, five and 400 pounds versus 150 and it's, uh, it's weird. Meltzer says, and it looked even worse than it sounded. Hoovy looked like a mosquito going against a giraffe. Expect you might be able to train a giraffe to do a good drop kick. Um, <laughs> you know, as the only way to improve this match. And I know what you're thinking. Well, I mean, Hey, we could fix it. How do you fix it? Van hammer. So we got van hammer out here. This is Meltzer would write. This is probably the single worst match Guerrero will ever be in negative one star. And I think negative one star might be being polite. What'd you think? Ladies and gentlemen, this is a rare moment. And I want you all to remember where you are right now. If you're driving in your car, if you're at work, if you're at home, whatever it is you're doing, I want you to remember this moment, just like you remembered where you were in other significant moments in your life that really make a difference. I agree with Meltzer on this one. It was horrible. It was so horrible. And I, you know, I, uh, I don't know where to begin. Ron Reese, great guy, nice guy, wanted it so bad. I think Barry Bloom pointed him in our direction. And I wanted it for him. You know, there's not a lot of seven foot four inch guys running around. Right. It's not like you'd find one under any rock, right? And, you know, we had the giant, we had Paul White, and, you know, the idea of having another seven footer, you know, Kevin Nash, you know, seven footer close to it, you know, it was a, you know, we wanted it to work and he, he put the time in, it's not like Ron didn't try, but I'm watching Ron last night and I got to be careful because he is such a good human being and, and I don't want to say anything too disparaging, but you got to kind of call balls and strikes here. He was seven, four, whatever he was, 
but he had the shortest arms of any fucking giant I've ever laid my eyes on. He looked like a Tyrannosaurus Rex or one of those dinosaurs. They are huge, but they got these little short little arms. His arms didn't match his body. That's the one thing I noticed. And, and he was awkward. You know, he was so awkward. And he tried to do a couple of things, you know, that he should have never tried to do. And that wasn't his fault. He was inexperienced. Whoever laid that match out with him, Terry Taylor, Kevin Sullivan, whoever it was that laid that match out with him, um, should have done a much, much better job for him, especially because he was green. But, man, that match was just flat out horrible. Just horrible. When I saw Ron Reese try to literally, you know, I call it a back leg round kick or or, or a low leg kick, um, Hoovy, it was just so ridiculous uh, and unbelievable that I just, I cried inside. I cried. I didn't want to cry on TV, but I, I cried inside last night. Oh, that's <laughs> fucking great. I wish you would have saved it for the show here. Um, Chavo Guerrero Jr. and Eddie Guerrero, they go 14 minutes and 46 seconds. Meltzer would write, very well wrestled, but no real heat. This is another feud that makes no sense. Eddie, who is one of the best wrestlers in the business, is afraid to fight his crazy nephew who on television gets squashed still by everyone. So he's pretty critical of it, but in the end, he didn't hate the match. He gave it three stars. He says... They had about three minutes cut from the match very late. So a lot of what they were building up for never materialized and they had to rush into the finish. Hypothetically speaking, how would he know that? Oh, I don't know. How, first of all, he, he didn't know half the shit that he wrote. So you, you have to start off with that premise. He, Dave Melzer, typically in my opinion, and by the way, in the, you know, I've been talking to more and more people, some of whom we both know, some of whom are currently working in WWE because they hear me bust on, on Meltzer. They hear P- Pritchard bust on Meltzer with you. And now I've got people calling me all of a sudden going, man, keep it up. You're so right. We read about the shit to this day that he's writing about w- he meeting Meltzer and he's so fucking far off base. He's just connecting dots. that in some cases don't even exist. And that's certainly what he was doing back then. So when you ask me the question, how would he know if the match was rushed or what the deal was? I fuck, I don't know. Maybe, maybe somebody told him that maybe somebody in WCW that wanted to have a good relationship with Dave for whatever fakakta reason, um, shared that with him. I don't know. I just think think the mat. Go ahead. I was just going to say, it's, it's pretty obvious when (laughs) the, the guy writing the story says, Hey, they had several minutes of their match cut at the very last minute. Well, fuck who else would have known that the agent and the wrestlers, right? Yeah. I mean, it's in my guess, it would have been the agent. That would be my guess. Right. Because it was so important to a lot of these, you know, the agents and some of the peripheral people, you know, on the management side of things to maintain that, you know, relationship with Melzer. So he didn't say or write bad things about those particular individuals. That was their fear. So they'd feed him shit. Or they defend themselves to him and, you know, fade the heat to somebody else or whatever the excuse was. But that's typically how Dave, when he did get inside information, he got it from, you know, he got it from people that would do that. And I would imagine it probably came from whoever the agent was, which my guess would be Terry Taylor. Yeah. Or it was Eddie Guerrero himself. I mean, it starts with him heaping the praise on about how he's the best wrestler in the world, blah, blah, blah. Chavo gets the win here. And now... You know, this, this is in the era where they're doing fun stuff with the Guerreros. And I don't know when we'll talk about it again, but they had like the slave angle, which is pretty fun. Uh, go out of your way to see any sort of Eddie Chavo stuff from this era. Let's talk about the next match though. We've got Booker T taking on Dave Finley here. They go 13 minutes and 13 seconds and Booker T gets the win for the WCW television title. And Meltzer would say crab was still dead for this one. Although again, very good work. But the fans didn't want to see Booker T again, and it pretty well took it out of this match. Uh, he gave it two and a half stars or two and a quarter stars. The finish, which I really enjoyed, was one hell of a pile driver. Like, I don't know that I've ever seen a pile driver like this one before. I dug the match, although Meltzer says the fans and the crowd didn't really so much. What do you think? Uh, well, again, a reflection of, you know, Meltzer's basic ignorance. Um, I think. Look, they, 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 I, I agree with him on the obvious part, you know, 
that you don't have to be a, a, a faux journalist or a wrestling expert or even a hardcore fan to see. I mean, literally, if you just bought the pay-per-view and you watch the crowd, you go, oh, wow, the crowd's not into it. It, it doesn't take you know, a real intellect to, to arrive at that conclusion. Um, and the crowd wasn't into it. But it's not because, as Meltzer said, they just didn't want to see Booker T again. That's, again, an example, the kind of derisive, derogatory kind of observation that a guy like Meltzer would, would, would make in order to prop himself up and make him seem to be more perceptive and knowledgeable than he really is. The reason that they didn't really want to get into the match, or they didn't get into that match, quite frankly, is Fit really wasn't over. He wasn't a great opponent for Booker T. That wasn't Fit's fault. That certainly wasn't Booker's fault. And it certainly wasn't because the audience didn't want to see Booker. It's because the match that they saw him in, they just didn't buy into. The stakes weren't really there. There was no real story built up between the two of them. It was kind of a transition match, I guess, to to get Booker where we needed Booker to be. But the fact that the crowd react was no reflection at all on Booker T. It was a reflection on Booker T's opponent, which I don't mean to be derisive towards Fit Finley because Fit Finley is Fit Finley is an amazing guy. He's got a wealth of knowledge. He, he was a great performer at one point, but in this particular match, he didn't have any steam on him. And that wasn't even Fitz's fault. Decent match, two and a quarter stars. Wasn't my favorite Booker T match of the show, but certainly it's a big moment for Booker T's career. You know, I think most people still talk about the best of seven more so than they did the TV title win, but it is cool to see him get a singles title. And this feels like a bit of a breakout night for Booker T's career. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. And that's what everything was designed to do was to, to really push, you know, Booker T and get him to where he was a viable, you know, contender and a viable player at the very top. So obviously, you know, at this point he's a multiple time TV champion, but still, you know, we're moving him up the ranks here and having two matches on pay-per-view and winning a best of five against Benoit he's leveling up. And so is bill Goldberg. Who's going to pin Conan. Uh, in a minute and 57 seconds here to retain the U.S. title. And Goldberg's got one hell of an entrance here, and we know what we're heading towards in just a few weeks in the Georgia Dome. Uh, what do you think about uh, about this Goldberg match? It only goes a minute and 57 seconds. We've got lots of shenanigans here because we've got uh, Kurt involved and Rick Rude involved and Kevin Nash and Lex Luger, and there's a lot of stuff going on here. What do you think of this match? I well, was it, you know, it was a typical Goldberg match, typical in a sense of, you know, it wasn't going to go long. We knew what the finish was going to be. We knew it, you know, we, we knew what to expect, right? I think Conan was at the top of his game uh, at this particular time as a character. Uh, no question about it. And I, I think this win was a good one for Bill. Uh, I think the, you know, it's funny because it caught me by surprise. You know, when I, when I saw Kurt and part of, part of it was, you know, just because of my relationship with them and my thoughts about them, when I saw those two walking Conan and out, I went, Oh my God, I forgot all about that. And then seeing them together, you know, whatever, I don't want to get emotional about it, but it, it just, it, it threw me for a little bit of a loop and I forgot. I was thinking about other things. Let's put it that way. I was thinking about other things about Kurt and Rick <clears throat> and I really wasn't thinking about the finish of this particular match until it occurred. And it's almost like, Oh man, I forgot all about that. And I, I kind of got into it because it made a little bit of sense, but again, you know, being self-critical and, you know, if I would have known then what I know now, it was just, it got too convoluted. I mean, the whole red and the white, you know, I, I understand what I was thinking and it probably made sense to me at that time. You know, going back to one of the things that you comments that you made early on when we first started uh, the show was, you know, you had to be thinking, you know, since business was so good that you're on a good, you know, you're in a good direction, you're on a good path, why not keep it going? And I think that was certainly true with regard to the NWO, because all of the success that we were having up to that point, whether it be in ratings, whether it be in house shows, whether it be in merchandise, any measurable you know, factor that you wanted to point to was really because of the NWO, primarily. You know, there were some secondary things that were working pretty well too, but if you had to pick one thing, it was really – the, the, the just dramatic turn in business as a result of what we were doing in 96, 97. <clears throat> that being said, 
again, th- another kind of convoluted, diluted finish. And I'll say it one more time, and I'm starting to get sick of hearing myself say it. I just, I wish to God we would have been better at thinking through more creative finishes because everything felt like a run in every, you know, whether it's Van Hammer or, or anybody else, there was just so many of those types of finishes and looking at them now, I, like I said, I just wish I knew then what I know now. Well, this is, uh, the, the era where there's the red and black and, uh, the black and white, and that's obviously a big part of the Conan angle here. So it's early Goldberg right before, you know, he becomes the top guy. Uh, it's worth checking out. It is a moment in time. This one next up though, we've got something we probably never thought we would see. We've got Hulk Hogan teaming with Bret Hart. Hogan, of course, has got the world title and, uh, he's tagging with Bret Hart here to take on Roddy Piper and Randy Savage and their reluctant partners. Meltzer would write Piper got the weakest entrance reaction I've seen for him in years and Baltimore should be a bigger Piper town. While Piper and Savage got separate introductions, Hart came out to Hogan's music. It was terrible. Uh, he gave it a dud and, uh, Piper is, um, obviously at the center of the storyline here, but what we're really talking about is the way that Bret Hart has turned on Randy Savage the prior week on nitro. And at one point we see the injured knee of Savage wrapped around the ring post. Once Savage comes off the top rope, selling that his knee is given out and that allows Bret Hart to put him in the sharpshooter for the submission. It gets a dud rating. It does feel like uh, it's sort of thrown together, but it is cool to see Bret Hart as a heel here. Although a lot of people probably didn't like seeing him play second fiddle to Hogan. What'd you think? Again, quite a few mixed emotions. Um, I, I guess as a match, I, I agree. It was just, it was the shits for, for a number of reasons. Um, it was so amazing though. Yeah. I see Roddy, you know, coming to the ring with his music. You know, I haven't seen that since Roddy passed. I haven't looked at a Roddy Piper entrance, um, particularly in one in WCW, since he passed away. So I, I literally got caught up in that moment, um, which affected the way I looked at the match last night, you know, seeing Randy, uh, in some of the promos that he did leading up to that match last night on the great American bash, you know, just seeing Randy again, um, again, you know, made me think of the, you know, my perspective was different while I was watching the match last night. Um, and it wasn't until the match actually started that I, and, and actually seeing Bret Hart walk out, you know, he came out ahead of Hogan, uh, and then Hogan came next. And then there was fucking Brutus, the barber beefcake carrying the belt that just made me want to vomit. It just, ugh. I mean, I got hot. I actually put Bret over last night and said, okay, now I know why he hates me for no other reason than that. I got to give it to him. <laughs> he deserves to hate me just for letting that happen. Um, and, and that's probably a more of a reflection of how I feel about Brutus, the barber beefcake than anything, but it was dumb. It was just dumb. Creatively. It was not a good choice. Um, and what made it even worse was when you watch that match, you know, it's like Brutus, you got one fucking job, dude. You gotta, you gotta use that belt. You gotta, who, I can't remember who, who was. And I watched last night, he, he hit somebody in the back of the head with a belt. I think it was Randy and oh my God, it was so horrible. I honestly got, if I would give the belt to my wife and said, okay, now sneak up behind somebody. The camera's going to see you sneak up behind somebody and waffle them with the belt. She would have done a better job than Brutus did. It was horrible. And it's little things like that, that no matter how good or bad or mediocre a match is in the middle, when that's what you see at the end, again, it's, I've said this analogy, I've used this analogy before. It's like going to a really, really great movie where you get sucked into the story, you get sucked into the character, you get sucked into the action. You're so invested in the movie. And then within the last three minutes, in the most intense shot of the movie, you see a boom mic show up in the middle of the, of the screen. It's like, oh, fuck, take me out of the moment. Why don't you? And that's exactly what I saw last night. So there you go. That's how I felt about that. 
not a great match. Um, some of the, uh, offense, you know, that Piper and Hogan and Savage are doing at the very beginning with the eye pokes and then trying to hold a guy one way or another, some, some cartoonish stuff based on what we've followed so far with guys like, you know, Goldberg with all the intensity and Ben and Booker T and, you know, some of the clinics that we've seen so far. And then this one, especially when you've got guys, who you know, can have great matches. I mean, Randy Savage and Bret Hart are regarded for having great matches, but they couldn't do it here. It gets a dud. And then next up, we've got Piper taking on Savage and they have agreed to wrestle each other right after the tag match. And Okerlund enters the ring as Piper acts as if he didn't want to wrestle Savage since Savage was injured on the finish, but then Savage just jumps him anyway. And you can imagine what's going to happen here. Um, along the way, Savage attacks referee Charles Robinson, who is wrestling's Benjamin button. What a hell of a bump. If you haven't watched this pay-per-view, if you haven't seen this pay-per-view and you, you were too young to see it when it aired originally, go, go to WWE network, get this pay-per-view fast forward. If you're in a hurry and get to the point in this match that Conrad's about to describe Charles Robinson became my hero of all time. Last night, when that bump he took was fucking amazing for a ref bump. If you're going to use a ref bump, that is a textbook. Charles Robinson ref bump. I'm going to get a, uh, a text message. Charles listens to the show and loves when we talk about him. So thanks for listening, Charles. Uh, it's a hell of a bump though. Go out of your way to see it. Uh, eventually Piper uses a low blow and puts Savage in the figure four. And then Mickey J runs in and calls for the submission. It only goes a minute 37, but there's a lot of action for that minute 37. It gets a dud. Um, after this Savage doesn't wrestle on pay-per-view for like a year. What's up with that? As hurricane would like to say. <laughs> Story. Well, I don't know what story we're trying to tell when the giant comes out smoking a cigarette, but he does. And the giant is going to take on sting here. And they're, <laughs> this is real guys. This is the main event of the pay-per-view and the winner becomes tag team champions. That's right. The winner gets both tag team titles sting versus the giant in a singles match. They go six minutes and 40 seconds. Sting ultimately gets the win. And it's probably because the giant came out smoking a cigarette which is hilarious because sting had done an interview the prior week, mocking the giant saying he just spends all day smoking cigarettes and he's out of shape. And, uh, of course, big show or giant at the time comes out wearing a t-shirt over his regular outfit. Maybe he's subconscious about that comment, but he is smoking a cigarette. What'd you make of, uh, this match? Obviously it told an interesting story where Sting's trying to do whatever he can to get the reverse DDT. He finally gets it. And, uh, the match only gets a star and a quarter, but the, uh, the premise that it's two guys in a singles match wrestling for the tag titles, and it's the main event. And one of your main eventers comes out in a shirt, smoking a cigarette feels like someone doesn't give a shit your thoughts. No, no, that's, that's not true. Now I, I will admit that the, the premise of two guys, you know, wrestling a singles match for the tag team titles is awkward at best when it comes to making sense. Um, the idea really was though, to create heat between the guy who lost in this case, the giant and his tag team partner. So that when he had to go back to his, to, to, to the black and white, now there's an issue because his partner actually lost the title because of Paul. So that was the, however weak premise to that story or that angle. Um, it's the reason why love it or hate it. That's the reason why. Now, when you talk about the. The cigarette, there's a couple things. Number one, it was a good example of a bad idea um, in, the, in, in that one of the things that had worked for us and continued to work after this really was taking real elements of a character or real elements of a story or real elements of a conflict whether it was, you know, Ric Flair and me with our legal issues or, you know, heat that would exist between, you know, two wrestlers in real life that everybody knew about. Uh, and in some situations, integrating that, you know, real life, well-acknowledged heat into a creative storyline. That was, that was a good device. It didn't always work. But for the most part, the odds were much better than not that it would. 
And this was the case with Paul because, you know, we'd all see him backstage and he, he was chain smoking. You know, he's an amazing athlete. And that's one of the things that you'll notice in this match. You know, when Sting gets Paul, you know, back into the corner and he's working him over, and, you know, Paul's, Paul is spread out, you know, horizontally over, you know, a 90 degree angle over the, the top ring ropes and flipping himself over and, you know, selling the action. You know, that's not easy to do for a 200 pound guy. Right. It's a lot hell it's a hell of a lot harder to do when you're a 500 pound guy. His athletic ability was really demonstrable in in this particular pay-per-view and you can see it if you look for it. But one of the the you know, the weaknesses in Paul, uh number one he was insecure. He was very young, you know, he was new in the business. Um he in in and he was a sensitive guy that could get very insecure from time to time, and his one of the other flaws was his health habits, and smoking was one of them. So we thought, you know what? Why don't we try? Nobody else is doing that, you know. It's one of the things that you do. And I'm not trying to defend it, by the way, because it was a fucked up, stupid idea idea and i'll take responsibility for it i think it actually was my idea directly i don't think somebody came to me and like others you know many cases somebody you know, what we see on television is somebody else's idea and they come to me and i go okay well we'll try that you know indirectly my responsibility but not my concept originally in this case i'm going to take the hit completely on this one because i thought okay wait a minute nobody else nobody else is coming to the ring smoking a cigarette which is kind of a kind of an anti-hero, kind of a badass, kind of a – it's the kind of thing that you don't see anyone else do, which is what makes something memorable. When you have a unique characteristic that nobody else has that defines you, when you've got a seven-foot whatever-inch guy, 500 pounds, walking out to the ring smoking, obviously not training too hard, but because of his sheer size and power is able to beat people – that kind of makes them unique. I'm not defending it. I'm just giving you the thought process. It was a horseshit thought process. It was a, it, it was a bad idea, but that's at least, you know, what the idea was, you know, at that point, somebody had been coming to the ring, smoking a cigarette for like three years, right? No. Yeah. Sand that? Sandman. Well, oh, fuck. I wasn't watching that shit. <laughs> so if I'm not watching it, it didn't happen. I get it. No, it didn't happen in my mind. You're absolutely right. So, so obviously the storyline here, you know, to touch on the, the tag thing is these guys win the tag titles when, you know, Scott and Rick turn on each other at Slambury and it feels like there's an opportunity now for Scott Hall to recruit and he does big show. Obviously, by this point, though, Sting has revealed himself to be with the NWO Wolfpack, and we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about Sting's red and black face paint instead of the black and white. What'd you think of the tomato Sting? <laughs> I think he did a great job with it. You know, you, anyone's opinion on, you know, the Wolfpack NWO or the black and white original NWO, put that aside. I, I think Sting looked like an it looked like a million bucks. Let's get to some questions. We wanted you to have an opportunity to ask Eric some questions and you can do that every week on Twitch at twitch.tv forward slash 83 weeks. Uh, and we're going to take your questions now and you can ask us a question on Twitter. It's at 83 weeks. So stay tuned for our upcoming shows. You're going to see what's coming next and you'll be able to ask questions right there. Uh, but before we get to these fan questions, you just watch the pay-per-view Give me your rating on great American bash, 1998 Meltzer's readers usually do thumbs up, thumbs down or thumbs in the middle. What say you, I'd give it a thumbs up, marginal thumbs up, almost thumbs in the middle, but I, I would give it a, a marginal thumbs up. All right, let's get to it. Uh, Robert Marino wants to know what was Brett and Hogan's relationship like at this time? It's weird. You know, it, it was strained and. I can tell you Hulk really wanted to have a good, he didn't want to have heat with Brett. He didn't. He felt that it was undeserved. I mean, it wasn't whining about it or bitching about it, but it was like, what the fuck is he hot about? He's got no reason to be hot at me. Brett up until, you know, that point had been very vocal about how much he hated Hulk Hogan. Um, like he hates everybody. I mean, that's just Brett Hart grew up probably hating people 
and just got more vocal about it and had a bigger platform later on in life. But, you know, in Hulk's mind, you know, Hulk was excited about Brett coming in. I mean, that, I can say that unequivocally. I mean, I remember talking to him about it. You know, we had a lot of conversations about it. You know, Hulk invited Brett to his house. Brett came over and, you know, swam and played in the pool with Hulk's kids. Hulk did everything he could to try to have a great relationship with Brett. But if you go back and watch his pay-per-view, look at the look on Brett's face as he's walking out. He fucking hated it. And he looked, he probably had the same look on his face when he was getting his teeth cleaned. It's just, you know, it was what it was, but it wasn't because of Hulk, but it was a strained, it was a strained relationship. Dave has a question. You know, there's a, a famous story that circulated that there was a show where Bret Hart received a, received a prank phone call claiming that his father passed away. And David thinks that's this show. Do you remember that being this show? Yeah. Yeah. I remember I was pretty hot about that. I was really, I mean, look, I, I get, you know, I've never been one. I never tried to rib anybody. I've never appreciated anybody trying to rib me. And unfortunately no one really did nothing, nothing that really mattered anyway, little shit, but nothing, all of it was like frat house fun more than anything else. But there's a line you know, that you don't cross. And I was very, very angry about that. It's one of the few times I've been genuinely deep down inside pissed off in a way that took me a long time to overcome. Well, you know, that, that does sort of explain why he had sort of a, a shitty demeanor, you know, no, he had a shitty demeanor. No, no, his demeanor was very apparent long before that incident and maybe it, it, maybe it had an impact on him that evening. And I would give, you know, and if it did, I don't blame him. You know, I'm not, I, if that isn't, if, if Bret Hart ever gets on a microphone or ever does a podcast and says, well, the reason I had such a shitty look on my face and the reason I wasn't into that match, you know, was because I, yeah, I didn't really like Hogan. I didn't really like coming out <laughs> with Brutus the Barber beefcake carrying the belt. I, I would have to acknowledge that. But if, but if he were to say, and by the way, earlier in the afternoon, this is what happened. If that's, if that's why he was in a bad mood and he looked like he was pissed off. I, I don't blame him a bit. I would be too. Let's talk about, um, you mentioned him, Brutus, the fucking barber beefcake. The disciple is involved in the show here. And Michael wants to know, cause he says not too long after this Piper goes on nitro and actually says his real name, uh, Edward H. Leslie. Were you aware at the time of any sort of real life heat between Piper and beefcake? No, I wasn't, but man, I can certainly understand why there was. I, I'm, I'm picking up the vibe that you're not a big beefcake fan. Not at all. You want to speak I to mean, that? You know, this is going to be hard <laughs> without it being a whole show. Okay. So I'm going to try, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try my best to, to give you a short answer and we should, we can talk about this another time, particularly sure. if we ever talk about Hulk, Hulk's contract and, you know, the kind of things that made, you know, his contract such a topic of conversation. But let me say this, Hulk was and is one of the most loyal friends and people that I know. I mean, he's been loyal to me in situations long after we were both, you know, out of the business in ways that no one else has been. He's, I see him being loyal and protecting and doing things for people that makes me just shake my head to this day, but that's just Hulk. That's what's important to him as a human being. And Ed Leslie, Brutus, the barber keep beefcake was Fortunately for him and unfortunately for the rest of us, one of the beneficiaries of, of that part of Hulk's personality that once he becomes loyal to you, you damn near have to, you know, you have to work full time to get, to get him to be disloyal to you or to, or to just walk away from you. And Brutus made a lot of money for a lot of years, you know, taking advantage of Hulk and, and. And being the guy that Hulk was continually loyal to, I would have never hired Brutus, the barber beefcake. If it wouldn't have been important to Hulk and Hulk wouldn't have been important to WCW. He never would have come through the door. I had no, no desire 
to to bring him onto the roster. But it was important to Hulk, and because Hulk was important to WCW, it was one of those choices that I made. Um, and there were others. And we can talk about them some other time because we're talking about Brutus right now. So I never really liked Brutus as a performer. I didn't really have a feeling one way or another about him as a person because I didn't really interact with him. You know, he, he, he was a quiet guy. He, he wasn't the type of guy that I had to spend a lot of time debating or discussing or going over creative with or anything like that. Um, I just didn't work with him directly enough to have a feeling about him really one way or the other, other than I knew he was, yeah, I, I don't want to call him a parasite, but I can't think of a different word right now. Um, he was just there because of Hulk's loyalty, not because he was any good at what he did. There's the truth. Um, it, but th- but that's not why I resented him. Because, it, look, he he was in a good situation because of Hulk and because Hulk was a loyal guy. Um, you can't really fault a man for that. Yeah, you may not respect his talents or abilities, but I didn't fault him as a human being. Um, and I didn't resent him as a human being because of it. Because, you know, he was – he was doing what he had to do for himself and that's okay with me. But it wasn't until the last few years that my feelings about Brutus have really become exacerbated. And because now I see, and I've seen it, I've been at autograph signings where Brutus is signing autographs of him and Hulk with Hulk's signature on them. And you're in the business, peripherally. You you understand this. You've been to enough of these shows, and you understand the value of autographs and, and things like that. And what Brutus would do is he'd go get a bunch of these pictures printed, printed off of Hulk and himself. He would fake Hulk's signature wow. and add his own. And I'd see him selling these fake Hulk Hogan autographs with his autograph on it for a lot of money. And the people did, that were buying them didn't know any better. And, and that's when, that's when my respect for him as a human being just evaporated into thin air. He, he went from being, you know, a guy who was just taking advantage of a loyal friend to being a true parasite. There you go. Well, I don't know that I expected that. Uh, I feel like we should roll credits. Um, we had some more questions, but I don't know that we'll, we'll beat that. So let's just wrap this episode up right there. Let's do go ahead and remind you that you can ask questions about our next episode right now at 83 weeks on Twitter. I feel like we should mention what we've got coming up in the next two weeks. And Erica haven't even ran these past you. Are you ready? I'm ready. I think it's time, man. We're almost upon the 20 year anniversary. So let's do it on Monday, July 2nd. We're going to cover the nitro dome that's right the georgia dome and nitro took it over july 6th 1998 goldberg becomes the world champion one of the most iconic moments in wcw history and arguably the most important moment in nitro history would you agree yeah i would well one of the top three top three there you go we're covering it next week goldberg hollywood hogan not on pay-per-view on nitro we're going to talk about the who what when where why And that's happening on Monday, July the 2nd. On July 9th, we're going to be back at you celebrating the 20-year anniversary of Bash at the Beach 1998. The biggest pay-per-view in WCW history. It popped the biggest buy rate, and we'll examine the who, what, when, where, why. What might we talk about when we cover Bash at the Beach 98 next week? Mm, I don't know, man. That's up to you. I'd have to go back and look at it. Think, Think about what stood out to me the most. So I'm anxious to have you walk me down memory lane. Well, we're going to do that over the next couple of weeks on Twitch too. If you haven't already, you need to get with the program boys and girls. We're going to revisit these shows and you'll get to watch these shows with Eric on twitch.tv forward slash 83 weeks, and then tune in here as I cross examine him. So it's going to be fun. If you haven't already check us out on Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash 83 weeks. And as always, you can pick up a shirt over at ericbischoff.com. And when you go over to ericbischoff.com, eventually Eric's going to call and thank you for picking up a shirt. And you never know when he calls to thank you, you might actually be live on Twitch. We've got a phenomenal shirt over there right now. Mabel was the third man. All the proceeds of that go to Mabel's estate. 
We've also got the fire shirt, which is stone cold, Steve Austin and Sean Waltman's favorite shirt. Easy does it is the one I'm sporting around the house. And you know that Eric is a big fan of context as King. All those shirts are available right now at 83 weeks. It's the pro wrestling tea store. You can find it directly in your web browser. Just type in Eric Bischoff.com. And when you pick up that shirt, Eric's going to call and thank you. He is at E Bischoff. I am at, Hey, Hey, it's Conrad. And we are out of time. 